Hey, 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 this is The Rest. Welcome to the episode. This is the rest of my thoughts and the rest of our church and the rest of all kinds of things. The rest of the people, the rest of the discussion, more dialogue, all kinds of stuff. Theological um, topics and more and more and more. And a disclaimer, this is not a sermon in the sense that what we're discussing here, we're laying out to be preached but it is a piece of it. It's a part of the discussion, the underlying thinking. And uh, these are my thoughts and interests. And these are many of your thoughts and interests. And it's a time. This is what the rest is, is a time for open and safe opinions, dialogues, teaching, and all the rest. So at any rate, uh, I'm glad to be um, having this discussion today. We have a special edition of the rest because we're, we're going to skip all the other stuff that uh, I typically do every podcast and jump right into the resurrection because we're going to try to unpack the resurrection in, in, in this in this episode. So I'm here with John McCambridge. How you doing? Good, man. I had a whole thing about Sheets Coffee. That <sighs> I was ready to unpack. Yeah, That's right. Fine. That's fine. We can... People are going to have to wait for that. All That's right. a good cliffhanger. Yeah. That's next, going to bring people back time. just like coffee does. <laughs> um, but uh, but we're so what we're going to do today is spend the majority of the time talking about the resurrection uh, apropos Easter is a week and a half yeah, away. We're getting there. We're getting there. And we spent two episodes, um, prior to this talking about the cross and we hope that you enjoyed that. And, um, kind of the, one of the episodes got cut off and we missed a whole section of the cross. And so we're going to just do a little, a little bit more on the cross today. And that should really take us pretty naturally into Easter because the cross came first mm. and then Easter and Easter made the cross matter. And the cross makes Easter matter a whole lot more as you just kind of start to go in that, that relationship between the two. So uh, John's here. John's our resident theologian. And uh, he and I have spent lots of time discussing the cross and Easter. And I'm really excited to have this discussion today on a recording because you and I to have this discussion, it's like, to talk about the cross, like even I'm getting ready for my Easter message or getting ready for a, you know a, a cross message. And last year you you spoke on on Good Friday, on Good Friday. yeah. And, and you know, right? Like we spent two hours talking about the cross last time we met, and it's so hard to just like focus, you know, a 45 minute message or whatever it is, and get to get there and assume all the people in the room have caught up to speed. And that's the nature of the gospel in the kingdom of God is we live in a world that wants a microwave version of this stuff. Like that's the way we're trained the past 75 years. Like, give me the this. And even in the wake of the massive evangelical movement, it's a, you know, what would you say in one minute if you were teaching the gospel? And like the elevator pitch, the elevator pitch, yeah. the airplane ride. And I was having a conversation with Scott, a friend of ours, Scott Lacrosse yeah. about this. Cause he's like, He's hearing from from me that, you know, my take on the kingdom of God and what the gospel is, is a lot more like what Jesus said than what we grew up hearing in the sense that when it says Jesus went about preaching the good news and then in quotes, it says, be, you know, repent, the kingdom of heaven is near, right. i.e. the kingdom of heaven being near, that's the gospel. The good news of Jesus's presence on earth, that is the good news. He's here. And so that's the message, but... Um, we grew up kind of with this, okay, elevator, airplane ride. If you, if this plane were to die, where would you go? Making it all about where you go. And we had this, this really interesting discussion where just, I found myself saying things like, you know, the reason that the plane or the elevator pitch dialogue is, is even a thing is because of a misunderstanding of the gospel. It's like, if the gospel is all about where you go when you die, then let's have that conversation about Let's let's and and I believe a lot of that that language is because of fear that came out of World War II and the Cold War. It's like okay, we're all going to die. We better figure out where we're going to go when we die. Yeah. So let's just let's just get to the point. So essentially, the airplane conversation is like an analogy of what a lot of the gospel that we believed growing up, the evangelical gospel, if you will, not that the evangelical gospel could be wrong. Those are all good terms, but like the idea that you're a sinner, you need to believe in Jesus because if you die right now, you, you go to heaven or hell. That plain analogy is kind of like a microcosm of the idea that everyone's going to die. So we're living in fear, mm -hmm. 
But the thing about a plane, which is so interesting, is most of the time you fly on a plane, you don't die. <laughs> so it's a <laughs> every weird time for me. Well, every time for me. And I, I just flew on a plane and I was flying American. And every time I get on planes, it's like blows my mind. I flew like a 787 massive Big plane, point. nine rows or seats across. So I start like studying. And then like I read that American airlines, cause I get afraid on a plane. Yeah, sure. Sorry. This is a, a tangential thing, but I get afraid on a plane cause I don't do it every day. Right. Like, you, you know, you, you, you freak out. So you get on a plane well, American Airlines has 7,000 flights a day. Yeah. seven. I mean, so that's just American. So it's like, you know, there's really not much to be afraid of. You know, there's a lot more scary stuff like driving your car, or going to bed at night. But like, it's like you freak out. But again, the gospel conversation in, in terms of what we believe is that the conversation about where you go when you die, that's of course important because there's a problem. We're going to die and what next? Yeah. Big, that's important. And it shows up for everybody. So it's like, obviously there's funerals and people get sick and you're going to have to deal with where you go when you die. But the gospel message is not about just where you go when you die. It's about how we live our lives and what God originally intended for us. So instead of on a plane asking, hey, if we died today, where would you go when we die? Really the discussion for, I believe, someone that wraps their arms around more of a holistic picture of the gospel is when you get off this plane, where are you going to go? Yeah. Like how are you going to live every day of your life? Because yeah. the kingdom of God is for you when you go off the jetway and yeah. walk into the world. Well, I, think it's, I think it's, how are you going to be a disciple? How are you going to be a disciple? Because that's a great commission. Yeah. That's the thing that like. Or some, even, I mean, for the person that doesn't believe it's like, Hey, so yeah, what does but, this mean to you? But I'm saying what do you do live your life? You're preaching or whatever. You're preaching the gospel to them. Yeah. As a part of the great commission. Yeah. But the great commission is to go and make disciples. Right. Yeah. It's not, to it's not to tell them something that you can a, say in two minutes so that you don't go to hell. When exactly. You die. I said, I said, how many people need, I said, I said, so he asked me, what would you say if you had to do the elevator pitch? And I said, well, I, I don't really care. I was like, I would have a two minute conversation with someone if I'm getting off the elevator with them. That's like, you know, whatever's relevant for the moment. And if I'm like a firefighter, and I need to like, know, like, of course, if there's a moment someone's dying, they're caught and it's like, Hey, do you believe in Jesus? Like I, I could, you know, probably put together some ideas. Like, do you have faith in Jesus Christ? Do you understand this resurrected Messiah? He offers that to you. If you believe in him and even the criminal on the cross, when he was going to die, like if you believe that he rose, like you might be able to like, con like come up to a place of faith right now. I can pray that with you. I could say that to somebody yeah. right when they're dying or whatever, but that's not the gospel. The gospel is this like comprehensive lifetime journey of understanding who is the person of Jesus? What was his life about? What does the resurrection say? Discipleship, right? Yeah. So, I, I, one of the best ways I've heard it described is it's embodied allegiance. Yeah. All your life. So even the information that we learn about the, the cross and the resurrection and all that stuff, it's not so that we have the right understanding because if you're wrong, then you're in trouble in terms of where you go, it's because we need to learn about who it is that we Worst. are giving our entire allegiance yes. to for the rest of our life yeah. and then for eternity. Yeah. So th I think that that's important. It's that's important. discipleship. Yeah. You know, to be, to be, to become like, but if we believe that what's most important is, Oh my God, those people are dying. They're going to go to hell. I got to tell them something. And it's, I got to figure out what to tell them to get them to get the right things so that they don't end up in the right place. It's like, we're completely missing what this cross and resurrection narrative in the life of Christ is all about, what the human life is all about. And so I, anyway, yeah. I, I just, I think it's important these discussions as they lead people in. And as you're listening to all of this, like, I know that a lot of this stuff, you know, it sounds different it can be disorienting, but just, just humble yourself and learn and like, listen and like engage in the dialogue, you know, like I was reading something recently about Jewish rabbis who sit around and one of their practices was to read the same passage over and over again and basically disagree about it. Mm -hmm. Talk about how one, I think it means this and I think it means this. And they're talking about like, you know, Isaiah 40, some or 53 or some kind of passage that's like almost, it's a pinnacle for what their, their people believe. And there's multiple different views on it. So it's like, because we may not think 
the exact thing that you thought you were supposed to think or you think I'm supposed to think, we are not throwing away all of the ideas that we that you grew up with. I think the way I view it is like the gospel, like a lot of times we get it handed and it's a tent and like it's like in the box still wrapped up and you see the two tent poles or two tent poles and a little bit of, of fabric, but like when you open it all up, it's like, oh, there's the full thing. Like some of us may have gotten handed the tent while it was still packaged tightly. Yeah. And it doesn't mean it's not the tent. It just means that that's not what that is. That needs to be fully opened up. And so part of this discussion is about that. And, and part of just, I think, honestly, the journey of faith and being involved in a faith community, my goodness, like, if, you know, I'm the pastor, I'm learning every day. I think everyone else needs to learn every day. Open up to it. If you hear something that rubs you the wrong way, don't run away, run into it, ask questions, push it around, like build your faith. Um, anyway, so John, with the cross, we covered lots of things, but there's one more major piece that we need to dive into again um, uh, about what I believe is the wrath of God specifically, or was it in the context of penal substitutionary yeah, atonement? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. So penal substitutionary atonement, um, uh, is this, is this idea that, um, because of our sin that, um, we deserve to die. So the wages of sin is death. That's what's, that's what, uh, Paul summarizes in Romans. And it's a summary of the reality of the Genesis story. Yeah. You know, in this day you will die. So the wages of your sin is death. If you eat the tree fruit, fruit then you die. You earn death when you sin. And, uh, you know, immediately there is something that covers their sin with the skins of an animal. There's this talk about something coming and crushing sin and destroying it. And, and then you see these pictures of substitution like Abraham and Isaac, right? You see Isaac's going to die and then a ram takes its place. And, uh, and then you see, you know, these lamb and their blood gets spilt and that gives the Egyptian people the freedom to spring out of slavery. So you have blood and you have perfect sacrifices and you have substitution. And then, you know, it, it comes into the place where Jesus is what I think John says, the propitiation, right? He's the satisfier of God's wrath. And so the idea of penal substitutionary atonement is that instead of me getting the ultimate penalty, which is eternal separation from God, uh, death that way, Jesus steps in my place. Mm -hmm. It's like God, like we're in the firing lane. And then right away, you know, uh, Jesus pushes us out of the way and stands in front and he takes the shot on the cross. And, and then it's like he died in our place. And because he paid for it, because the wages of sin is death, well, now the death went to him. It doesn't go to me. Yeah. And so then I get whatever I, 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 I get forgiven or it's paid for. It's paid in full. So the wrath of God then can be looked at like, you know, if you look at that from one perspective, like a father who's like, that's what he's going to do. He's going to kill his son. This one of the where it becomes a misconception. Yeah. So just to kind of take it from there, I mean, like, and I'm sure I didn't summarize it perfectly, but the substitution of Jesus for me yeah. to satisfy God's wrath, to pay the penalty for sin. Yeah. So I think sometimes the way that we frame it is unhelpful. So the idea that we deserve death because of sin is actually worse than that. It's that we, we get death because of sin. It's a result of it. Yeah. So it's the wages of it. It's not like... Someone's, you know, saying, oh, well, you, you know, said this thing. And so now you deserve to die. It's that in our sin, in our rebellion against God, we're separated from him. And just like eating from the tree, the very first sin is that if you do this, you shall surely die. Yeah, you'll die. And so we shall surely die. So it's not really even about the concept that you and I understand in our world about deserving. Like, like a, um, like a punishment, like, okay, you eat the fruit, you die. It's Actually, the reason that you ate the fruit is why you die. You yeah, chose. It's, just, it's the inevitable result of that. Of, of yeah. being autonomous, yeah. saying I'm going to self-govern. Yep. And so since we don't conceptualize that, then it makes it seem like, well, that's quite a harsh punishment right. that God has arbitrarily decided to put upon us yep. because we broke some rules or whatever. But you know, the, the reality is, is that sin, in, in, according to scripture, is really, really serious. Mm -hmm. It is 
rebellion against God. It is the destruction of God's good world. Mm-hmm. It is purposeful opposition mm-hmm. to him mm-hmm. from his image bearers who are supposed to be his resident mm-hmm. rulers, mm-hmm. his delegated authorities. Mm-hmm. And so the, the wages of sin is death. We will die because of sin. Mm-hmm. And sin cannot stand in the kingdom of God. Mm-hmm. So when the kingdom of God comes, sin will be condemned. Mm-hmm. Now, the problem is that sin is in our flesh. Mm-hmm. We're mm-hmm. embodied. Right. So there's no such thing as a human that's not embodied, right. which I think we'll talk about when we talk about resurrection. resurrection yep. But if you, if you are a soul floating around, you're not a human. Right. You're not an image of God. Right. And so to be fully human is to be embodied. But what happens after the fall and what you and I participate in pretty much every day is, is that we sin, we rebel, we're against God in our flesh. So sin will be condemned, but that sin is in our flesh. So that means that, that the wrath of God that opposes sin will be opposed to us in the flesh, Mm -hmm. except for the fact that God became flesh and blood himself. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. then on the cross, sin, as Paul says, was condemned Mm -hmm. in his flesh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so if through faith we're bound to Christ, Mm -hmm. then sin will not be condemned in our flesh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is a substitutionary aspect. But get into the, I mean, I think the part is like, you talk about how sin doesn't fit in the kingdom of God. Therefore, sin is God's aim when he is... He's trying to take out sin, yes. not take out people. He he wants to get rid of the problem. Yeah. Well, he's not, not, he's not opposed to us. He's opposed to sin. He's opposed to sin, but, but sin happens because sin. of our yep. rejection of mm-hmm, God. Mm-hmm. That's the thing. So, so people think that sin is this inevitable thing, and so the fact that God gets mad about it is capricious or arbitrary, but that's not true. Right. You know, we are, when we sin, opposed right, to him. right. And so if the kingdom of God's going to reign... What would you say to someone who who doesn't actively like orient themselves around intentional opposition to Jesus, but they just are living in sin? Um, you, you know, in the garden, uh, it, the, the serpent doesn't say, eat this fruit so that you'll be opposed to God intentionally. Right. He says, eat this fruit because what God has told you is not true. Right. And you can actually decide right and wrong for yourself. Right. So I don't think that it is necessarily about like, oh, I hate God. I'm going to go against him. It is the, a replay of the garden. Every time we replay the garden, every time we don't submit, every time we don't surrender. What about then, someone that doesn't know they're supposed to submit or surrender? Like, I'm just saying like, what if someone doesn't understand that Jesus is God or that there's a God and that there's a wrong and they're just like, I'm just doing this. Yeah, they're still they're still just like to God, <laughs> but th- but but they're not <laughs> even like, if it's unintentional, right? For sure, and it's and it's the same. So they they would be they would be brought to the place of oh, you know, when you're doing that, you're actually opposing God, even though you didn't know you were opposing God. Yeah, which is essentially what Paul continuously tells the Gentiles in his in his preaching ministry. Right. Uh, he you know he tells them the gospel. He says, "I know you don't know the story." Like, I know, you're not Jews, so I know you don't know the story. Uh, but actually, you know, Romans 1, you, you are opposed to God. Mm-hmm. His divine attributes are are made known so that you're without an excuse. He says you're without an excuse, but even, you know, e- even regardless of that, you know, it, it is in this sense that when we live against the grain of, of what the God wants order. for us to in, in this life as images, that it is opposition. And so, uh, you know, the, the biblical idea is not that God is opposed to us and so he wants to kill us. It's that we are opposed to him. And yeah. as long as we're opposed to him, that relationship can't happen. I mean, think about a relationship between people. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, they say it's a two-way street. Communication's a two-way street. Love's a two-way street. Right. Well, what that means is that you can't will somebody yeah. into a relationship with you. At some point, they yeah. have to actively engage in that. Yeah. As long as they're opposed, you're not going to have a healthy relationship. Right, right. In fact, you probably won't have a relationship at all. Right. There has to be some kind of, um, you know, two-way mm-hmm. desire mm-hmm. for a relationship. And so the oppositional part that has to be overcome on the cross is our opposition to God. Mm-hmm. So that's why it's important to understand that when, while we were yet sinners, mm-hmm. Christ died for us. Mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. the substitutionary aspect of atonement, that 
that, you know, uh, he doesn't have to, it's not that God wants to kill us. It's that he so badly doesn't want to. Yeah. That, that he's he willing himself to die. takes it upon himself. Yeah. I mean, it, it, th- that's the Trinitarian aspect of the cross, that the idea that it's divine child abuse or whatever yeah. some of the deconstructive sure. languages around that is heretical in the sense that it disregards the Trinity. Yeah. Jesus is not separate from God in, in an ontological way. He's the son, which is the part of the Trinity, right? The father, the son, and the Holy spirit. And so it is God himself yes. who takes on flesh and blood, who, who in whose flesh and blood sin is condemned. Mm-hmm. And therefore that's why it's an act of love mm-hmm. instead of some kind of like Jesus steps in front of a bullet aimed at us. Right. That's not true. God yeah. takes upon himself the the penalty, yeah. the inevitable penalty of sin. Yeah. And so sometimes when we preach penal substitutionary atonement, because it's the way that we humans would act, yeah. what we think is that God hates us mm-hmm. and he wants to kill us because of sin, mm-hmm. but Jesus takes that upon himself instead. Mm-hmm. And therefore we don't have to die and yeah. suffer that and go to hell. Yeah. But the actual biblical logical flow is that God loves us so much that while we were yet sinners, Mm -hmm. Jesus dies. Mm -hmm. And that means that the actual relationship is reconciled. And the way you just said it is so much more insightful and articulate than I think most people can, can comprehend, but they believe it. And I agree with, with it fully. Um, But a simple way to put it too is the, is the idea. And this oversimplifies it is to say that God loves the sinner, but hates the sin. Like he wants to part us from, that so he he's not opposed to us he's yeah. opposed to our sin yeah but he actually so he does. takes on sin so the the reason that that saying is sometimes problematic is because when we say it as humans hate hate the right. sin love the sinner we actually usually hate the sinner we usually, too. usually actually do and so it, it create it makes that saying, well that's why we say it we're trying to trick we're, ourselves we're trying and, not come on, to do that i need to but, love them even though i don't right. love what they're doing or whatever and that's why like god is other than us yeah. he can actually do that he and can. he does but yeah. the way that he does it is not you know, it, it is important for us to understand that that we do not get a free pass on our sin. Yeah. It's not okay. Yeah. Like that that's one of the problems with this argument is a lot of times the people that come at this from the angle where they don't like substitutionary atonement is they what what they actually don't think is that sin is serious enough, enough to, for that to, to have warrant to happen. That. Yeah. yeah. That's that's false. Right sin has to be condemned in God's kingdom. When people are, when people are saying that a lot of times they're wrestling with the personal manifestations of what someone might say is a sin. And they're trying to build some argument that they don't have that big of a problem, right? Like I'm not that much of a sinner. It's not like my stuff is not that bad. Right. And, but then most people agree to some general level of, evil and darkness and sin in the world and and don't want it around and you well, know when you really when you really dig into a lot of times what people have issues with it is actually that they disagree with what sin is like right yeah that, there, that behavior is not yeah, actually right, sin right which right. whatever that that's a different conversation yeah. but the point is that you know sin in terms of the biblical story it is the problem it is the problem so it has to be condemned yeah. it yeah. has to be destroyed it yeah. has to be gotten out of here and it's in us yeah so that means that just like he had a chance throughout the whole biblical narrative, he could get rid of evil. He could get rid of sin by getting mm-hmm. rid of humans. Yeah. He doesn't want to. He refuses to. He wants us to be his image bearers at yeah. whatever cost. And the right. cost ends up being his own life. Right. And, and the cost ends up being his own life. Don't you, the way I've always thought about that is like, that's because God made images and he knows what matters to us. So the whole communication process of, who he is, what he's done has to resonate with us. And so he, the, 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 why, why did he, why did he have to die? Like, why couldn't he have taken care of sin and death another way? Because no one else could do that. The only reason that it worked is God did it. God took on flesh and blood and God took on our sin. And then when God was receiving the penalty for the sin in our flesh in his flesh because it was God. It did something that could only happen 
for us. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, it's kind of like, well, why did, why did he have to take on sin and death? And how did his death condemn it? How? You, you know what I'm saying? Like, I, yeah. I don't, I, maybe I'm, maybe I'm confusing you. I'm just like, yeah, I, I mean, I, I it works I, I think because, I understand what you're asking. because if we align it this way, theologically, we're saying like, that the sin that we have, God took it on and he was innocent. And then he paid a death penalty for that sin. So you don't have to, because he takes it out of you. He takes the sin and death away from you, mm -hmm. but it's still kind of like, well, how does that work? How does, how does it work that he takes it away from you? Yeah. Like how does him dying for it just, but it's all because it's been laid out before that blood covers sin, you know, substitution yeah. in the lambs. Like, I, I don't know. Like I get a little bit like, I don't want to throw people off. <laughs> like, well, <laughs> so remember that through faith and what we act out in baptism is that we become united with him. Right. It's ontological union. So ontology is like uh, the being. Mm -hmm. So we actually become united yep. with Christ through faith yep. and the Holy spirit. Yeah. So, we're bound to the one in whom, in whose flesh mm -hmm. sin has been condemned. Mm -hmm. And so, so sin gets condemned in his flesh. Yeah. On the cross. And then, and this should take us directly to the resurrection, but it gets condemned in his flesh. So then it's not condemned in our flesh. Right. And, and, and then it kills him. Yeah. Because the wages of sin, because the wages of sin is death. So he gets, he becomes sin, then because he becomes sin, he dies. dies. And then at that point, it's is it kind of like sin one? If he stays dead. Right. So, but For you sure. have the holy day, sin one. It's like, that's what happens. The wages of sin is death. But then Jesus rises. Yeah, if, if you're looking at it like a cinematic sequence. Right. But like, I think that in terms of like the essence of being, it's all connected. It's all connected, So yeah. like he never actually loses because he raises, he's right. raised from the dead. Right, right, right. But if he was never raised from the dead, then sin is not condemned in the flesh. Right. Death is not defeated. Yeah. And none of the, what we say the cross accomplished, it's actually accomplished. Right. So sometimes people get hung up in the order of operations, and I think that that's okay to, to wrestle with that stuff. But the point is that when you look at the holistic equation, that he rose from the dead means that what happens on the cross is the confrontation in which Jesus wins. Yeah, right, right, right. He God wins. In the flesh. Right. But, uh, and I say this in the, the class that we teach on biblical theology, if he stays dead, then sin and death sin, win. Sin and, and death win, yeah. Right. So... So the cross means what it means in light of what we're going to talk about now. Yeah, yeah, no, it's the great. resurrection. So with the resurrection, I mean, look, I want you to just kind of launch into the biblical theology of resurrection and and take it from there, right? I mean, sin ha and uh, the confrontation between good and evil has happened on the cross mm -hmm. and Jesus is dead. And then he raises to new life on the first day of the week. Yep. So just kind of John the theologically just, or you want to take it historically or I don't know take it take it I don't know however you want to like if you're going to yeah. frame the resurrection frame it so in terms of Christian theology historic Christian theology um uh he actually dies so that's really important number one because the way that he defeats death is that he actually dies and then is raised to new life so one of the temptations in theological history, the history of the church has been to say that resurrection is metaphorical mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in terms of some kind of spiritual, mm -hmm. but it's not true. And that's yeah. what Paul says in first Corinthians 15, right. which is that if he did not rise, rise. from the dead, then your faith is in mm -hmm, vain and we're mm -hmm. to be the most pitied people mm -hmm. in the world. And so, you know, N.T. Wright always says that there were words to say some kind of spiritual, spiritual encounter. Yeah. yeah. There was an entire philosophical tradition of Platonism yeah. where your soul is freed from your body right. upon death. And that's actually a good thing because right. it's in this 
prison of flesh. Yep, tomb, yeah. So that that those are well established historical traditions. That though, if if the authors wanted to say that, they've got words for that. Oh yeah. And so they use the word resurrection, uh, um, anastasis or mm-hmm. something is the Greek mm-hmm. word, and and th- it means that he died, and then it means that he didn't stay dead. Right. Uh, that's it. Right. I mean, even in terms of historical word studies, like you know, it all falls apart. Uh, the the early Christians believed that Jesus died, he was put into the tomb, mm-hmm. and then he was raised from the dead. He mm-hmm. wasn't dead anymore. Right. After a period of time passed, he mm-hmm. became undead. Undead, yeah, right. And came to life in yep. a resurrection body. Yep. And so what that means is that everything that happens because of sin and evil and the forces of darkness, which we've been talking about over the last couple of weeks, all of the consequences of that were not only laid upon him, but fully um, fleshed out. Mm-hmm. No, no pun intended. Yeah, yeah. Fully, all of it. Yeah. Because death is the ultimate weapon of the tyrant. Yep. Earthly tyrants mm-hmm. and, and spiritual evil sin tyrants. And de- yeah, yeah, darkness. So uh, the death of Christ and then the defeat of death is the whole point Mm -hmm. of our Christian theology. We have to understand that, that, you know, it's okay if it freaks you out that it's a bodily resurrection. Mm -hmm. It's okay if it freaks you out because, you know, we look at it and we say, well, people, when people die, they stay dead. Mm -hmm. But it's not like the ancient people were too stupid to know that. Mm -hmm. They knew that when people died, they stayed dead. Mm -hmm. They knew people didn't rise from the dead. So what they're saying is that something has happened, Mm -hmm. that God has moved in an extraordinary way in the resurrection where this thing that doesn't happen happened. Mm -hmm. And not only that, but as you say, that resurrection is our direction Mm -hmm. because that is essentially what happened to Jesus will happen to all of us. Mm -hmm. And that's the, in terms of biblical theology, the future hope Mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, history, there's not that much in the old Testament about resurrection. Right. So, uh, Daniel chapter 12 verse two Mm -hmm. seems to be really specifically Mm -hmm. about a promise of resurrection. Mm -hmm. There's other, uh, second temple Jewish literature, Mm -hmm. like the wisdom of Solomon and second Maccabees, I think that very clearly references resurrection. Yeah. But even at the time of Christ, which I think this is outlined, I can't remember if it's in one of the gospels or in acts, but, um, there's controversy amongst Jewish leadership about yeah. resurrection. Yeah. And so the Sadducees who are the temple leadership really don't believe in resurrection, mm-hmm. but the Pharisees who are the synagogue leadership believe in resurrection. Mm-hmm. And it's a big controversy. Mm-hmm. The resurrection that they believed in is a general resurrection that happens at the end of time mm-hmm. where all the righteous are raised from the dead mm-hmm. to live in the kingdom of, in God, the kingdom of God that has always been promised. And the reason that that's what they believe is because the restorative project of God from Genesis 1 can't happen as long as we die Mm -hmm. and sin and evil and death reign supreme in this world. So Mm -hmm. how, if God's going to make everything right, how is he going to do that? Uh, Yeah. Well, he has to get rid of death. Death, yeah. Because death is the ultimate weapon Mm -hmm. of all that opposes Mm -hmm. God, the God of life. Mm Mm-hmm. And so resurrection is really like the only possible Mm -hmm. end of the the story of scripture. Why? Why? Because I I know like, I think it's maybe in first or second Samuel that after the resurrection, you know, Paul and these guys look back at these passages that a king will rise, you know, a king will rise. And then they go, Oh, that, 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 and that my reference might be wrong on that, but they, they do look back retrospectively and go, Oh, that must be what that meant. But John, what do you know? And I, this is a hard question, but like, if it's, why isn't it talked about more? Resurrection? Like the- Today? No, no, no. Why, why doesn't, why doesn't the Old Testament narrative and, you know, it, what, whatever, Samuel, when he's talking about David or whoever, and he's like, this is all where this is going to go anyway. Or, you know, if they get beat by the Canaanites, why doesn't Joshua be like, let's go and let's fight because if we die, we'll resurrect and, and half of them die or whatever. But like, yeah. wh- why? Like, it, it is kind of weird that it's just not 
in very much of the Torah, the law, yeah. the, the prophets. Yeah, I mean, it's like, what, what do you call it? Uh, progressive revelation, mm-hmm. that it kind of progresses through time. And there's a lot of things that happen because of Jesus that the apostles say clarifies the mysteries of the Old Testament. Yeah, they, they look back, they see it new. Mm-hmm. But but I mean, you know, I don't know, Daniel 12 too is pretty clear. Mm-hmm. The, uh, yeah, on the clouds. Um, Dan- Daniel 12, 2 is something about from the dust oh, we from will the rise death, from again the dust or something rise like again. that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so, um, you know, it, it is something that had at least enough biblical evidence that they're, that the most powerful people in Jesus's world, because Jesus was not really a part of the temple world. He was from Galilee. So he was a part of the diaspora with synagogues and all that. The most powerful people in that structure were what you, I guess you would call resurrectionists. Yeah. They believed in the resurrection. So it's not, the apostles didn't make it up. No, no, no. I just, I, I just wonder why it's not written about more or yeah, you don't see a, it in more. I mean, because Daniel's apocalyptic literature and visions and, you know, we're in Babylon. Like it's crazy, which I'm not saying it doesn't mean it's, it's, it, it, it's there. It's just, it, it is. So uh, they, they started to see it in hindsight. Yeah. Which is how, which is how they started to interpret the Old Testament generally. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So um, they, they interpret it in light of Christ, in light of the cross and resurrection. They interpret lots of things differently than the historical, and then what goes on to be the rabbinical Jewish tradition interprets those texts. Yeah. Because if Jesus didn't die and then be raised from the dead, then those texts don't mean don't what me- the early church say that they mean. Sure. One of the things I, you know, we read into right all the time. He gives a couple implications of the resurrection. With this, this lines up with what we're talking about. The first one, he says, the disciples started to see that the Jewish script, scriptures, which they had studied from the time they were small boys, were fulfilled, but in a totally different way than they had anticipated. Yeah. So, part of it is we thought it was A. It actually turned out to be W. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Okay. And and. And, you know, our understanding of things changes based on the phenomena that happen around us. Yeah. So, like, you know, there's, uh, with, like, something like World War II, you would say it's not smart to invade Russia in the winter. Right. Because of what happened to the Nazis in that campaign. But if the Nazis had won, that wouldn't be a saying. Yeah, right. It's like, it's like that was a bad shot unless that, you made it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right, exactly. Right, right, and right. so that's the same thing with biblical interpretation. Like, I think that... That it is everyone who argues that those are unorthodox interpretations of the Jewish text, they're actually correct. Right. Because the only reason that they're interpreted that way is because uh, because of what they, the apostles actually saw right. in, okay. the, in the resurrected Christ. Let me read a couple more of these. A new creation, a new temple. The new temple meant that now God was going to be with his people in a whole new way. Uh, they saw the passage about ra- about raising up David's seed in a whole new light, which I forgot to write the reference to that, but I just first Chronicles. Oh, first Chronicles 17, I think. Yep. Yep. They realized that the promise which came through the prophets in the old Testament, that God would again deliver them from slavery happened with the death and resurrection of Jesus. And the new Exodus had actually taken place. Yep. The ultimate slavery is sin and death. And they got released from that. Right. Resurrection. That's, that's the, the Red Sea yeah. is the resurrection. Yeah. Pretty cool. It's the chaos waters yep. that get controlled. Mm-hmm. So but, just, but even, just talk, talk about that a little bit well, more. Well, even, a lot of people don't understand that. Which one? Just chaos waters, okay, yeah, baptism. So, so, so chaos waters in a second. The, the, like, why the interpretations happen like that, you know, with something like the, the Passover and the Exodus – you know, Jesus reconstitutes that whole tradition around himself mm-hmm. in the upper room before he dies. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of unfair for us to ask the early church to not interpret it in that light. Yeah, right. Yeah, they sat yeah. with him. He had a meal. And instead yes. of doing the Passover cedar, he said, you know, this this bread mm-hmm. broken for you, my flesh. Or, or, and, or instead of doing it, which I know is what you're saying, a new covenant, right? That's what he calls it. Yeah. The, yeah. The blood of the cup. Yeah. The, the, new- the, the cup has the blood of the covenant of the an new old, covenant. So you got an old covenant, but now he's going and we're doing something new. So he takes an old idea and adds 
more comprehensive language to it. Like yeah, but a, the, f- a summary. A summary. Well, the idea that he takes is the Exodus. Yeah, right. So then he reconstitutes it in a new way a around new way. himself. Around, yeah. So of course that they have to interpret that if they think what happened to him actually happened, they have to interpret it that way. Yeah, because he told that's them not, that's what it was. That's not creative interpretation. Right, that is right. the teachings of of Christ to the apostles, and so. Yep. Um, yeah, and then and then you know water it, throughout the Bible has an interesting. Tim Mackey always yep. says from the Bible Project always says that the the ancient Israelites did not like water. Yeah, which I <laughs> just completely concur. Water <laughs> yeah, is I mean, freaking. And if you and if you're ever out on a boat in the middle of the ocean and there's a storm, it's one of the scariest things ever because it feels like there's no escape. So it's if you not just a, say if you're ever out on a boat in the middle of the ocean, that's it. That's all. Yeah, for me. I, but it, but when the waters get chaotic. Oh. So it's the freaky. way that they depict creation is that God pulls order and beauty and goodness out of the disordered, chaotic mm-hmm, waters. Mm-hmm. That's actually what Genesis 1 right, says. Right. Um, it does say God created the heavens and the earth, but it doesn't really say uh, what he did until he starts to pull out Move of the it. water. Yeah, yeah. And so the whole story, and then, and then you think about you know, the crossing of the Red Sea and the God controlling mm-hmm, waters, mm-hmm. which everyone knows can't be controlled. Yeah. And then you think about the same thing happens when the Israelites go into the promised mm-hmm. land, the, the waters of the Jordan, Jordan River yeah. part. And then John the Baptist mm-hmm. is baptizing people mm-hmm. in the, the waters. And then Jesus gets baptized in the water and comes through the water. And then Jesus calms the storm out mm-hmm. on the sea. He walks on water. Mm-hmm. All, all of this is all thematically connected yeah, yeah. to the idea that in our general experience, water is uncontrollable. Mm-hmm. You're in a big body of water yeah. and a storm comes and, and you're in trouble. And so that's sort of what does it look like when life can't flourish? Well, it looks like you're stuck on the sea yeah. and there's a big storm that comes. And yet what Jesus is doing is he's controlling it. And, and so in a way that chaotic water equals death. Yeah, right. And sin, death. It, and there's all these stories in the Old Testament of the Israelites being delivered through the waters. Yeah. And so what Jesus does as a once and for all new exodus is he delivers us through the chaos and mm-hmm. the darkness, which has just historically in the Bible been characterized as water, mm-hmm. but he delivers them through the chaos and the darkness of mm-hmm. sin and death, yeah. the ultimate chaos waters. Yeah, it, it, it's it's an amazing story, especially when you get right into the narrative of the Exodus and you've got the people of Israel who are, you know, God's chosen people, mm-hmm. they're loved. And that's the offering, right? You can join that. Like, you, you know, if you're not already, but you can join fellowship of Christ and you can receive deliverance into the life he has for you yeah. from the life he doesn't want you to have. Like if you think about the nation of Israel and we think about what we we're talking about with wrath, yeah. well, you know, God doesn't, if, if he wanted to get rid of sin and death and, and tyranny, he could have just sent a, instead of locusts, he could have just destroyed with multiple lightning bolts, all of Egypt and just, just yeah. destroyed it. He could have flooded it and just everyone's dead. Yeah. But instead, what does he do? He pulls his people out of sin and death. Those who belong to him. Yeah. So that's the same thing as what it's like. God's his wrath is not opposed to the people of Israel. It's opposed to the, the nation of Egypt or analogously sin and death yeah, who, and the, slavery. Those who were, who were, had given their allegiance to other gods. Yeah. Right? Anything. And then, and then you, you see the story go, right? Like they make it through and Pharaoh and the army, they get crushed by sin and death Yeah, by water. Right. And they don't make it. And right. I mean, so again, some of these ideas that just get so hammered on, they, they, they can become pretty grotesque or whatever. But man, when you start to think about what God is offering, right? because it's not like, it's not like you, you or anyone else would want to be in Egypt. In slavery? In slavery. <laughs> yeah. Maybe, I mean, maybe just wouldn't, with Wouldn't a, you cry out to yeah, be delivered? Yeah, wouldn't you cry out to be delivered? Would you be real concerned about the the rights of your slavers, you know, it's a good question. Right. Um, And then, you know, of course, this is what baptism, this is what happened in baptism, right? So you go under the waters Mm -hmm. that, that were symbolized and and were typed in the old Testament Mm -hmm. as the Red Sea Mm -hmm. and the Jordan river and the chaos Chaos waters waters and creation. and and, And you go under the waters and you die in the chaos and in the darkness and the disorder, like Jesus on the cross 
And then you come up out of the waters into deliverance, just like the old Testament stories. And then, and then ultimately just like the resurrection. Yeah. And so that's the promise, which is cool too, to think about all the different analogies and then, which is not, I mean, those are real things that happened, but you know, in this, in, in the Passover meal, we're remembering something that God did for us. And then Jesus is going, this is no longer about the past. This is about the future. Yeah. I'm going to do this for you right? tomorrow, <laughs> you know, or in three days. And yep. what I do in three days is going to happen for all of you in however many days, mm-hmm. which is so cool. It's like, remember, your whole history has been about what happened, but the resurrection is about what's happening, kind of happened, but ultimately what will happen in your life. Yeah. In my yeah, life. yeah. It's definitely, it's definitely, you know, remembering to, to look, forward. look forward. Yeah. yeah for I, sure. I love that. Um, another thought is, uh, if Jesus rose from the dead, then he is Israel's Messiah and Israel's Messiah is the Lord of the world. Uh-huh. Psalm two seventy two eighty nine. He's the Lord of the world, not just the King of Israel. Right. He is the, the, the second Adam. He is the man that brings about life to the people on earth whom all need life. Yeah. Yeah. So according to biblical theology, the world belongs to God Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. therefore the world belongs to God's King. Yeah. And so what, what people were waiting for, and you see this in the Abrahamic promise Mm -hmm. is that, you know, through you, the whole world will be blessed. Mm Mm-hmm is that the, whoever the king, you know, the, the messianic king of Israel is, is actually going to become the king of the world. And so, uh, the ascension, uh, you know, is, is the time when, uh, Jesus goes up onto the throne at the right hand of Mm -hmm. God. He's enthroned as the king of the the cosmos, Mm -hmm. the living Lord of the cosmos. Mm -hmm. Fleming Rutler or uh, Will Willimon says that either Jesus is dead or, or he's at the right hand. He's of the, the living Lord of the cosmos. Right, those, yeah. those are the two options. Right. And if he's dead, then none of this means mm-hmm, anything. Mm-hmm. It's it's arbitrary. As Paul says that in First Corinthians. Yeah. I don't understand the argument against that. If he's if he's dead, he's dead. He's not the Messiah. Mm-hmm. He didn't defeat death. He didn't usher in the kingdom mm-hmm, of God. Mm-hmm. But if he's alive, mm-hmm. then you can't really do anything except give your wholehearted allegiance yeah, to him yeah. and change everything about your life and right. yourself in order to follow him because he's the king. Yeah. He's defeated death. That's the promise. And through union with him, mm-hmm. that's that's our promise mm-hmm. too. Mm-hmm. If we want it. Yeah, right, right, right. And when we understand what we're enslaved to and what being enslaved to it does to us yeah, and what God offers to us, in terms of our humanness and what it was designed to be, it should become nothing than, than attractive, mm-hmm. you know? I mean, nothing but exciting. Yeah. And, it, and, and, you know, this is where, so one of the things, cause, cause you've been teaching heavily and we've been teaching heavily on the, the resurrection. Yeah. You know, why? Most for three years. Yeah. Why? And pe- because it's uncomfortable for people. Well, and they don't believe it. I mean, not to be direct, but a lot of people. Well, yeah, well, they I, believe in the resurrection of Jesus. Yes, but they don't. They don't. They don't know mm-hmm. that the resurrection is your direction. Right. They, they don't think, know. They don't know that that's true. And so, what they think? Yeah. What do they think? Is that when you die? Yeah. Your spirit goes to heaven, mm-hmm. and you live forever mm-hmm. in some kind of disembodied. Mm-hmm bliss uh you know a lot of times it's pictured as like an eternal church service mm-hmm. a lot of times there's strange things like uh babies playing the harp harps on the clouds crystal sea streets of gold lots of art has been done about you know about this forever and ever but well but, and, and i think it's important too i don't know how fast you're going to move past that but there's 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 i will say reasonable explanations for why what the orthodox view of Jesus's resurrection and ours got twisted and and deformed into this idea of the, the the final destination of humanity is disembodied souls up into heaven. Yeah. So I mean, we can outline a couple of those. One is people die and they stay in the ground 
and they don't yeah, come I mean, back. Uh, and, <laughs> and, and, and if that happens for 10 years after the resurrection, okay. If it happens for 20, if it happens for 40, if you're John and you're 90 years old or whatever, and it hasn't happened, and mm-hmm. then another generation, it doesn't happen. It, it can turn pretty quickly just from sheer pragmatism into like myth or like that's not the hope or that's not the point or we misunderstood that. A lot of people were waiting for Jesus's return in their lifetime. Yeah, and so are we. Right, right. Well, so are we. But but they're 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 going. Okay, the king he he rose. Yeah. He he's coming to set up a kingdom, and then you know uh, whatever what is it? Forty years after the ascension of Christ, you have the total, utter, and destructive move of Rome. They destroy. Israel, like ne- like it never had been before, which is really hard to understand when you understand the history of how yeah. much the nation of Israel was destroyed by foreign nations. Uh, was it Titus? I can't remember who um, it is. I, 870 I, AD? I don't remember, but yeah, it was, it was the temple was raised, the city was destroyed. I mean, they yeah. carry all those artifacts back to yeah, Rome. Yeah, yeah. I've seen the arches of all the pictures of like all the stuff that they, they just destroyed it. So it's kind of like, wait a minute, this whole kingdom of yeah. Jesus thing, this is going in reverse order. This is no, this isn't ha- going to happen. Right. It's one of the reasons. Yep. There's other reasons. I mean, the, the, there is the, there's biblical evidence that when you die, there's some kind of union with God. Right. That's more intimate than what we experience now. Mm-hmm. So, what Paul says that he would rather die and be with Christ. Yep. Than to live, live as Christ to die as gain. I'd rather. Um, but. And, he, and Jesus says to the criminal on the cross today, you'll be with me in paradise. Right. So, so there's something. So when you die, Paul says to be absent from the body is present with, present the, Lord. with the Lord. So when you die, there is some kind of union mm-hmm. with God mm-hmm. that seems to be different mm-hmm. than now. There's mm-hmm. peace, peace, there's a lack of pain mm-hmm. and there's presence. Mm-hmm. And so that's a beautiful thing. And, and it's important. And, it's important that people understand that that what we're saying when we talk about the full, you know, life after life after death, when we get to this resurrection piece, which is the ultimate end here, mm-hmm. that we, we, we don't minimize that we've talked about this a lot. That's not the hope, but, but there's, there's hope. There's like, there's a sense of ease in, yeah. in, in, in that trust that a lot, most people have. Okay, grandpa's with the Lord. He's in no more p- pain, but it's not the ultimate idea. It's not what this whole thing is about. And right. actually, and actually l- let me read First Thessalonians because First Thessalonians 4, John, it is the passage that deals with this directly because the people in Thessalonica were thinking that Jesus was coming back right away. So they were quitting their jobs, right? They were like, oh, well, we don't have to work because the resurrection's coming. Right. And yada, yada, yada. So Paul kind of addressed this. He says, brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. So he's answering like what we're talking about. Like there are people, Carmen laughs and makes fun of us when I say that when people die, they're asleep. It's really just the state of their body. The theological idea is that they are in some uh, conscious experience, like you said, with the Lord, present with God, yep. in peace, all that, in in, in paradise, in, in, in somewhere. But we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And we also believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you, uh, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we are still alive and our left will be caught up together with him in the clouds and meet the Lord in the air. And we will be with the Lord forever. So the idea is that there are people who are dead and one day their bodies will be reunited with, with their spirit forces, whatever those who are asleep. Yep. 
and those who are dead and, and, and those who are here will just suddenly be transformed into resurrection forms. So the yeah. dead in Christ will rise. They'll meet, they'll become like resurrection, uh, Jesus beings. And then those who are asleep, uh, and then those who are there will just be transformed in the twinkling of an eye. Yeah. But that's the, that's the answer. Even now, 2000 years later, like, yeah. don't, don't, that's it. That's the answer. Resurrection is the answer, mm -hmm. not what's happening now. Sp bodies asleep, spirits yeah. right. in and, paradise. And I guess, you know, my, my, why would you want it to be? Right. Like, I don't know. I, I, I think that, that it, go ahead. Well, one of the reasons that I've done so many funerals, like, you know, and, and, is because the the general idea, the other reason, one of the reasons this this idea became so real, and actually Christians were part of this in like the first century, is life on earth during that time. Basically, you know, I've heard lots of different theologians say that life pretty much sucked on planet earth until like 1890. I mean, basically most people died. Most people didn't live very long. Most people died through childbirth or sickness or war or something like that. And life was really hard. So you get a hundred years after the resurrection, earth is really, really hard. And basically it's like, why would we want to resurrect in this place? I want to get out of here. I want to be up there and then you conflate these ideas of what paul said to live is christ to die is gain to be absent from the body is present with the lord if for the majority of people for a long amount of time is to be in the body is this awful thing i want i want bliss yeah the the only the only challenge i would have to that is that resurrection addresses that too it does but it hasn't happened so what does happen is people die and something happens then yeah, that is supposedly which, blissful which I think is what we're saying it's okay. is true. It's okay, right. It's just not the final hope. It's not the final. And to me, it's just, it's not the final hope in terms of any kind of biblical understanding. Right, right. So there is nothing about the story of the Bible. But see that, that John, that this is why you have to land on this really slow because that is not what people understand. Like when you talk about orthodoxy, the Bible talks about the bodily resurrection of the Lord, of people, our resurrection, his resurrection. Well, the creeds do. The creeds too. do, Yeah. Dude, people don't think yeah. that's the end game. And, and I, I know that that's one of the reasons we teach the bi biblical theology as the story of scripture mm -hmm. is because people don't know that the, that the Bible is a story. Right. They don't know there's a plot line. Right. They don't know there's a beginning, a conflict, yep. and then a, a long resolution mm -hmm. that leads to the whatever the original problem was being solved. Being solved. The original problem is embodied humans embodied, through yeah. sin bring about death. <laughs> That's the original problem. Yeah, yeah. That's what has to be solved. If we get zapped out in our soul somewhere else, then the story's not concluded. Well, God, there's, there's, what God wants doesn't happen. And original creation is not restored or redeemed. Something else happens because the the story of the of Genesis one is not a story of disembodied mm -hmm, souls mm -hmm. floating around. It's a story of embodied humans. To be human, according to biblical anthropology, is to have a body. Yep. Now, the bodies in the garden have access to the tree of life. And according to Revelation chapter 22, so will they. So will our mm -hmm. resurrected bodies. Mm -hmm. And all that is wrong with the world, every tear will be wiped away and mm -hmm. all the sad things will mm -hmm. come untrue. Mm -hmm. But it will be a life like this. Yeah. In but a without world all the like pains. this. And, you know, maybe you're right. Maybe, maybe this is a privileged thing to say as a. 21st century modern person but to me i always think like you know why why doesn't everyone just if they really believe that that when you die you you go to heaven and you're in bliss and that's what we actually want then why do we struggle so hard to live right that's the un that's the unsaid elephant in the room that we all have it's like you want a good life you want to be here you're you, spending your whole time like raising your kids we like it but why do we think that oh it's just you know i gotta deal with this and this is uh, uh, this is part of the discussion heaven's not you know or he earth is not my home i'm just a sojourner passing through like i'm gonna get to heaven and that's not the biblical story the no. gospel is is that repent the kingdom of heaven is near yeah and that it will come back fully yep. in the second coming of christ so we we want heaven and we want earth we want earth without the downfall yeah. of earth which makes sense so it's like well if we only get heaven i guess I, if i could pick earth with the pains in heaven i'll just pick heaven but god's plan is to 
bring heaven and earth back right. together and make this thing the way he originally so, designed so some it. Some people would be like, well, I don't like my life because I've been abused. Right. It's like, okay, well, what if that was taken away? Right. I don't like my life because of chronic pain. Okay, well, what if that was taken away? Mm-hmm. I actually don't like my life here because of these tragedies and these things that happen and these things about me or whatever. It's like, okay, well, what if all that was taken mm-hmm. away? That That's the biblical story. So one of the reasons that we don't all just kill ourselves is because we actually like this life. One of the reasons that we we cry when people die, even though we try to sentimentalize it and say they're in a better place they're in a better now, place. we don't want them to die. Right. We want them to be with us yes. on here. Yes. And so the biblical picture of final our final destination, new heavens, new earth, is a life like this with all of the things that we don't like taken away. Exactly. So to me... And more good than we have now. Oh, I, more because, good. Because of our proximity yep, with God. Yeah, yeah. Like even the best of us yep. in terms of spiritual discipline and union with Christ, it's a shadow yep. of what will be. Revelation's yep. metaphor is that God will be so close you won't need the sun. Right. Because he will light up. Yeah, right. Of course. He's the, an energy force. The streets. He's life. And so, so like, you know, to me, this is why the, the title of N.T. Wright's book about the resurrection, Surprised by Hope, is the perfect title. Yeah. Because what he's saying is that what the Christian understanding of heaven is, is better than we all think. But it's so different than what so many of us have been raised yes. by that when you stand up and you preach it, we lose people. Oh, well, we lose people, man. They, they don't want that. And so one of the things that's important to understand, this is the way that I've kind of started to talk to people about it, is that what we were raised to think about heaven is basically what happens after we die. Mm-hmm. Yes. Some kind of spiritual union with God that's closer than now, yep. but that is not the end. Yes. So whatever your hope was for your mom or your dad or your grandma or your best friend or whoever died and left you, that's happening. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. They are in, in a better union with Christ. Better place, union, peace, well, as paradise. Long, to me, as long as they're closer to God, they're, they're in, in a, a better, better place. place. But as long as their body's dead, they're not fully human. Yeah, right. And God's will has not been enacted yet. Yeah. And so one day, that proximity with God will, I think, even be magnified. Mm-hmm. But it will be with bodies that mm-hmm. are imperishable, mm-hmm. yeah. with access to the tree of life. Yeah. So like, I kind of think like, we'll know each other. Oh yeah. Like think about the beautiful relationships that we have. I think those are godly. So I think those will be resurrected too. Absolutely. I think that the people that you love, like you want to talk about reunification with people you love. There's a part of me. Now the Bible doesn't unpack what that looks like, right? but there's a part of me that's like, why wouldn't the godly, uh, beautiful relationships of our life through our families and our church and all that, why wouldn't that be resurrected too? Yeah. Let me throw a stick in the wheel for people that think that there's no marriage in heaven because they think, well, Jesus says no marriage, but he actually says no marriage in the resurrection. Yeah. So I believe that Genesis is the commentary on God's union between people and that that's his original design. Of course, he's going to want people to have their continued relationships into the heaven and earth future scenario resurrection is a moment in the eschaton that that jesus is getting at that that's not when all that will be reconciled yeah but there will be in the kingdom relationships that have already started yeah well marriage was a pre-fall a pre-fall thing condition. so why would it not be if it's part of what was bliss and i mean i don't know about yours but mine is just absolutely <laughs> blissful anyway so i don't even know what they're talking about are you winking at me right now <laughs> because it's not true because it's <laughs> it, marriage is hard but i mean that's the thing about that, that that's actually one of the the concepts yeah. that nt Wright lays out in terms of the biblical narrative and i share this with people on all kinds of topics but one of the things the authors are doing and i think this is called like um it's not like hyperlinks, but what does Tim Mackey talk about when he talks about um, there's all these different pieces and parts that are installed into the text that are layer after layer. And there's a phrase for it that will we'll come here when we're talking about it. But it, it's this idea that the Genesis narrative is, is all these different pairings, right? And I've talked about this, heaven and earth, water and land, male and female. Yeah. So you have heaven and earth coming together. You have male and female coming together. You have water and land in a relationship. You have animal and God vegetation. God and his images. God and his images mm-hmm. in a relationship. And then the divorce is heaven and earth came apart. It was never supposed to. 
but that ultimately what God wants to do is bring it all back together. And yeah. Paul hits on this with that recapitulation word in the book of Ephesians to bring all yeah. things together. And to reconciliation. Recon bring them back together that, appropriately. That prefix re. Yeah, re. Redeemed, re, reconciliation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like that, that means it's going back to something. Yeah, re, redo. That's why the story of the Bible is important. Yeah. That's why the resurrection yeah. is important. Yeah. Because... It's going back to what it was always supposed yes. to be. That's why God wins. Yes. Not because, oh, this isn't going to work out. So at some point, this all will be burned up and we'll get zapped out of here to yep. some other realm. Yeah. That's not what the that prefix R-E means. Yeah. It means that all that the great divorce will be reconciled. Reconciled. Um, so, so I think that like, you know, there is, and I know that a lot of people, it, it's interesting because, you know, the beautiful thing about the Christian faith is that there is a simplicity to it that can bring you into a relationship with God without ever being a theologian. Absolutely. But in terms of theology, as soon as you dive into it, you will quickly see that without resurrection, the bodily resurrection of Jesus being the, the, the future promise of the bodily resurrection of us, that the entire storyline right. and the entire theological project falls apart. Yes. And so it is important for us to understand. And what is really important for us to understand is that the resurrection of our bodies is better than what a lot of our conception of heaven is. It's not different. Mm -hmm. It's just that there's a next stage. Next. And he calls better. it life after life after death. Life after life after That's death. That's what it's about. One other concept that people have is like with the whole planet Earth, plan B type thing, it's like God's going to burn this place up. And and so just one of the things I want to hit on, because I, I that world I just grew up in, and there's there's a whole line of thinking that leads people to... Well, we've got the rapture, so I, you know I don't want to spend a lot of time on it. But if you if you still kind of believe in the rapture, that like God's eschaton, His end end plan is to snatch you up out of this because of the passage I read earlier, which is actually talking exclusively about resurrection for those that have already died and then those that are alive. It's talking about bodily resurrection. Right. There's a misinterpretation of that word there where people think that means that he's snatching us away. And really what it means is like a greeting of the Lord in the sky, the presence of the Lord, and you're going to be part of his presence. And then he's going to bring people into his kingdom on this earth that's been remade. So I don't want to like lose people if they're like, oh, 514 Church doesn't believe in the rapture. But just just for the record, we don't believe in the rapture as in left behind. Not in its classic, not in the way that people tend to talk about The it. word rapture means this moment that happens when the second coming of Jesus happens. And of right. course, we believe in that. We just don't believe it means that you're going to be snatched up away from here and put on the next planet and whatever, wherever that is. We believe that God's going to remake all this with our resurrected bodies and set up his kingdom on this earth. Yeah. Re, remake, reunion, all that stuff is going to happen. <laughs> re, redo, redeem, reconcile, yep. Yep. whatever it is. Like that, that's what we believe. And so just, you know, if, if you, if you hear that and, and I know I talked to a lot of you that listen to this, like if you hear me talk about the rapture and you're just like, man, like I, I you know, left behind and like that moved me. I know lots of people that really, that concept shaped their faith. And I'm not saying it's all bad. It's not all bad in terms of that eschaton matters and what's going to happen to you and all that. Those questions mean something. Um, those there's a book that really helped me called reading revelation responsibly. John, do you know who wrote it off the top Is of your it mind? Gorman. I can't remember. Michael Gorman sounds right but reading Revelation responsibly. Yeah, it's great. He does several, like book. almost like a whole chapter on like, he outlines 10 reasons, maybe it's seven, for why the left behind idea and the the, the theology behind it is, is not healthy and what it's done in a lot of ways bad. And I know some of you it was good for, but I, I think that it's worth because, worth looking at because it doesn't line up with the biblical narrative. The whole thing, like John just talked about, redo, reunion, come back together, uh, recapitulate, retell the story. I mean, the whole thing. Resurrect. Resurrect. Like, you're, you're up, and he's going to bring you up again after you die. Look, like, that's all about making heaven and earth what it was originally supposed to be and getting this plan back on track. That's not about taking this earth, throwing it in a trash can, and starting over. So, um, and like John just talked about, actually, if you think about that, it's what you want. If you're honest, you yeah. want it now, you want it then, and, you want And it. this idea too, 
Like I, the way that I think about that scene in, in Thessalonians in terms of greeting right. is that it's like when Christ comes back. So, you, you know, you know, the videos of the fathers who return home from war yep. and the kids see run them out and, and see they them. run to them. That's it. But like, imagine that, but the pull is infinitely bigger because as Augustine says, our hearts were made for God. Yeah. And we're not with him right. the way that we will be. So when he comes back, there's this picture in Thess- uh, Thessalonians where we 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 are caught up in the air. Mm-hmm. We we run to him. Yes. And then as his church, we triumphantly re-enter. Re-enter with the resurrected people that have fallen asleep that that are in that life after death stage. I, what what. What about getting zapped to a different planet or a different realm in our souls or whatever? What what's why is that better? Yeah, right. Than our King coming and summoning us to yes. go and greet Him and then come yes. down in yes. a victorious entrance mm-hmm. with Him yes. to reconstitute the new heavens and the new yes. earth. Like that's what I want. Oh, I yeah. want that. I don't want to be zapped away. I don't want to. Uh, so, so again, Paul, it's, it's, I've taught this, it's, Paul's, better. it's way better. And Paul's using that picture because again, he's using a picture of this is what Caesar would do when Caesar would come home from yeah, battle. Yeah. You, he would be out of the city. There'd be announcers, people that would go before with trumpets, with callings, good news. Good news the King is coming. Yep. And then people would run out to greet him. Yeah. And then they would go back in. So Paul is saying, the real king, he's going to come from the sky. He's going to be greeted by resurrection bodies, by the dead in Christ living. And then he's going to take up his place on this earth as our king. Yeah. As, as it should be. And with us. And with us, yeah. So like, like the, that picture in Thessalonians is a picture that we participate as his, as his belonging to him. Mm-hmm in that whole restoration that's going to yeah. happen when it comes in the twinkling of an eye. Mm-hmm. I want to read one more resurrection passage yeah, please, because there's so many good ones and they're right. They're right there in the, uh, in the text, but uh, they're easy to, to skip. This is in uh, Philippians three. He says, join together and following my example, brothers and sisters. And just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For as I have often told you before, and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a savior from there. The Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Dude, right? I mean, it gives me goosebumps. Yeah. It just Paul just telling people, people have read this passage in the past to think my citizenship, it's like if, if, I'm, if, I'm a, if I have a green card, and my citizenship is over there. You know, I'm a citizen of, of England, but I'm, I'm here. So it's like, I'm not from here. And that's, that's true in the sense with this picture in that heaven has not fully come back. So I am a citizen of God's kingdom. God's kingdom has been inaugurated, not fully manifested on this planet. And so, but it will be. And he, it says we await the Savior from there yeah. to resurrect our bodies you know, it's all about happening here. It's all about becoming like Christ in the resurrection. It's all about new heavens, new earth, the whole thing. Yeah. And so it's easy for some reason to miss because of just ideas that we get taught and, and theologies that move through, through the world yeah. and, and, and it's difficult. So, um, and because of Dante's Inferno, Dante's Inferno, it and just became several such a, other... a seminal work in, in mm-hmm. Western culture yep. that, a lot of what people believe about hell yep. is simply Dante's Inferno. Yeah, just like a lot of what people believe about spiritual warfare is John Milton, Paradise Lost. Yeah, like that's it, we don't since since we're not super into our Bibles, mm-hmm. we we don't we don't really exactly know how to parse those ideas, mm-hmm. and so this idea that there's you know most of the ideas we have about this stuff is actually from medieval mm-hmm. literature. Um, 
But the biblical story is pretty clear. Isn't it interesting that people use that text, part of it, to talk about how we are citizens of heaven? And, yeah, and yeah. that means us going somewhere, going somewhere else, else, even though the text is about awaiting the king oh, from it, heaven exactly. to come back to resurrect our exactly. bodies in explicit language. Dude, I mean... It, it, so again, it, I, I just think it's important to read these things when we're talking about the resurrection, because you're getting so much language that just is so counter yeah. to what you've, you, you know, what your hope is in. And I, you know, I, I really want people when, you know, when the, first of all, you know, I'm, I'm probably not going to get into all of this, but the resurrection of Jesus, it's the beginning of like this new creation process, right? Just, just kind of hard to wrap your mind around. You know, there's going to be a second coming where, where it's like, it seems like things in a way are going to get worse until he comes back. But in the meantime, he's got his church and his church has his spirit, um, his agency to a degree to bring about life and goodness and to see a sense of flourishing in, in, in like a partial way. That, that's really the only way to put it. I mean, Paul says that uh, outwardly I'm, I'm dying and inwardly I'm being renewed daily. So with the Holy Spirit's presence, we start the process of building for, prepping for, living for the kingdom right now. Uh-huh. Um, and, uh, and one day it will come in its fullness yeah. and that will be punctuated by resurrected bodies and kind of a restart in a new life. Um, I think it's easy for, for people to, to, to miss that and to know that it's so important that, that the resurrection of Jesus, what it means for me in the future is this hope of life to the full that, that really, I believe is what Jesus is talking about whenever he uses eternal life. He's talking about your life being eternal, not where you'll end up and go somewhere else is eternal. You will be eternal well, in your body. And the, the Greek is the life of the age. Yeah. So what for now, age? different the life age. of the age he's inaugurating. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. he, he, you know, he brought in a new age. Yeah. So, so they're overlapped. Yeah. yeah. And so we, we, we belong to a new age, eternal life, yeah. life of the age, yeah. the life of the age of Jesus. Yeah. And we, that will be continued. Yeah into the into the resurrection mm-hmm. is is what we believe. So his resurrection in 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 my past it means beginnings of new creation. It yeah. means it means the beginning of my voice and my vocation restarting with the Holy Spirit's partnership. That's literally what I think Jesus calls it or the paraclete, the one who comes alongside the, the helper, advocate, yeah. the advocate. So we have this like helper who because of the resurrection of Jesus he he, tra- he he transfers his spirit to his disciples to you know with with the whole Thomas narrative he breathes on them and they receive the spirit and then he sends them to go and build this following of people who believe in a resurrected king yeah. and and our hope is that that resurrected king his resurrection is my direction so yeah. i've got i've really got like bookends of of what the christian faith is right now i've got a resurrected savior who's given me a lot of it's almost like a head start. I hate to talk about the the spirit of God that way, like it's just a head start. But it's a down it, payment. It's a it's down payment. It's the beginnings it, right? of that, and and it brings me into a place of 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 bringing about life and flourishing in the kingdom of God into this place now, and then and then one day the kingdom of God will come fully. And so I, I really think for the Christian, you know, death just kind of becomes a speed bump. Like if you if this if this narrative lays over the kind of the the map of your brain yeah and you really start to live in this i'm building for the kingdom i'm living in the kingdom i've got the spirit of god now i'm raising my family i'm listening to his spirit i'm trying to do what he wants me to do i'm trying to serve when i can i really want to honor him every moment and yeah my body's gonna die like i'm dying i mean dude trust me i'm 41 i am dying for real but in ways, at 41, I feel more alive than ever before mm-hmm. on the inside because I feel like more than ever over the past, I don't know, five, seven years, I've partnered with the Lord in, 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 in working together with him to be about his business. Yeah. And then it's like, okay, I, I just genuinely, and you know this about me because I'm like, I'm ready to die. I want to get moving on. But like, I'm not afraid of death in the sense that like, I genuinely view it like it's a video game, but real. 
okay, I'll lose a life, but then I get a better life. It's like I upgrade right away or whatever, however amount of time. And I get, then I get to go back into the next phase of the human experience yeah. in a God led sinless world. That yeah. sounds amazing. Yeah. That sounds amazing. Right. Why, so I'm excited about that. that. Yeah. I really think that that's like Paul, why Paul's like, well, to live is Christ to die is gain. Like I have him with me. And then to die is like, just, I'm get to move forward closer to the next thing. That's way better. Yeah. I, I, you know, I'm going to the way better thing. Yeah. This is, this is morbid, but did you ever see the movie, the Island? No. <laughs> With you and McGregor no. and Scarlett Johansson. No, they're I like, remember these, like previews. For they're it, like but. clones and people pay for them. And then these people live in this like bubble and then they're, they get a lottery and the and they tell the people in the lottery that because they hit the lottery they get to go to the island. It's this awesome place, but really what it means is that their liver is ready to be harvested by their owner, so they go and die. So I feel the opposite <laughs> of that, <laughs> but I, I know that like when I go to the island, man, it's going to actually be really good. <laughs> that is just bizarre. I no, I have no idea. You have no idea where I was going wow. with that. Okay. So John, do you have anything else? I mean. Um, you know, I, I, I think uh, this is one of those this is one of those things with your faith where uh, it's it's uncomfortable if it's unfamiliar. Mm -hmm. And one of the encouragements I have for people is that what you and I are talking about and what we teach as a church in terms of resurrection as the final mm -hmm. destination is it's better. Yeah, and so to move through the discomfort mm -hmm. into, you know, submitting to mm -hmm. what the scriptures mm -hmm. teach, even though it might be uncomfortable for now, it, it's actually better and it leads you into greater, greater hope. Yeah. And that's, that is my oh, understanding yeah. of the Christian life mm -hmm. is that there's lots of things that, that Jesus says that, that the scriptures teach that, that are hard to stomach mm -hmm. or understand, or they're different than what we thought about the world or about our life or about whatever. But in that, through that discomfort is actually something more beautiful than, than we ever thought. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of my, uh, yeah, my prayer for people in terms of wrestling with something like resurrection. Um, there is no alternative story in the scriptures. Mm -hmm. So you can choose to not believe the scriptures, but the, the story of scripture is the story of resurrection. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Not just of Jesus, but that that event is an event that foreshadows what will happen for all of us. Yeah, that's exciting. It uh, should be. It is so actually exciting. It, 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 it actually fills me in a way like with joy and calmness that I've never experienced in my life. The and more I think about it, as we more. go into Easter, one of the reasons that day is supposed to be a day of such raucous celebration in the church is not just because Jesus rose from the dead, but because Jesus's uh, rising from the dead means that we will too. Exactly. So when we come together and we celebrate, it's not just because Jesus did something; it's because what Jesus did means Matters. something. Yeah. And it's a picture. Yeah. Of what's going to happen for yeah. us. I mean, I don't know. I've I've had some decent one-liners, but resurrection is your direction. It's a good one. It is. It, it, it's a zinger for where people are right now. It's a good one because they don't think resurrection is my direction. Right. They think resurrection was his thing, and now I have whatever. But man, guys, like as you're listening to this, just know. Also, too, I think I think if you're sitting and listening to this, and and you you've been in despair, like and and of course all of us have to to varying degrees. But it's certainly with sickness and certainly with death, like I want you to just think for a moment and just pray about a God who intends to fully redeem bodies, the broken bodies of your lost one, the sick people that are in your life. That is his ultimate plan to make everyone whole. This is why where he went when he was on this earth and in here, he healed people. It's like, this is a picture. Yeah. This is healing. Healing is a lot of times in the church, you know, people are like, oh, you know, we need to be healing. And, and maybe to the point that we have the Holy Spirit of God, there's a measure of healing that should take place. I For believe sure. that with all my heart, but that's not necessarily why 
Jesus was walking around healing people. Jesus yeah. is walking around healing people because he's the author of life and he's giving it back to sin and broken people, sinful and broken people and just sick people that mm -hmm. don't have what they're supposed to have. I mean, sometimes he gives it to people who don't believe. It's just an, it's just an outpouring. And that's not a commentary to say that you need to not believe in order to receive the, the, that, that. That's a different conversation. My point is that the reason that he was doing that was about who he is and what he wants to bring to you and to the world. And that should yeah, bring the, you hope in terms of what's going on with you and your family and your lost yeah. loved ones. And if you're, I mean, if you're your a grandpa, Christian, you're an Easter person. Yeah. You're a person of the resurrection. Yeah. That that's not because you're a person simply of the resurrected Christ yeah. that somehow proves he's God or something. It means you're a, re, you're a resurrection person because that's where you're headed. Yeah. That that's your future hope. Yeah. And when you come out of the waters of baptism or as symbolized, through the waters of baptism, you start that journey yeah, now. Yeah. You have the Holy Spirit within you. And so you, your life yeah. is partially resurrection life yep, right yep, now. And yep. the things that we do in the power of the Holy Spirit are yep. eternal resurrected things. Yep. And we get to actually participate in that now. Uh, Easter is beautiful because yep. of that. Paul does his big, you know, his whole major line of thinking on the resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15 and talks about how important the resurrection is. Our faith is in vain if, you know, if we don't have the resurrection. And he talks about doing work in the name of God and, and continuing to, to, to be faithful. And he says he ends the whole thing, which is not the last chapter in the book, but I, I think he ends, he says that everything done in the Lord or all the work done for the Lord is not in vain. Yeah. It's not futile. And he's not just saying like, oh, it's, it's important mm -hmm. in the context of the resurrection. He is saying that what you do now in the name of the Lord for the kingdom of God is something that will matter for a really long time into the resurrection, the future. So yeah. it, it, I think that if you, if you start to look at your life like that, I, you know, even this weekend, I, in my message, I said, I'm, I'm much more interested in building for the kingdom than just getting there someday. Like I'm interested in doing the kind of work that will be found in the kingdom of God and it will get in there through the resurrection right. of Jesus. And it's like, you know, so part of the whole calling of the church is that we're his workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Mm -hmm. what, what are those? That's, that's bringing heaven to earth. That's yeah. kingdom living life, believing people that, that just do things that God's like, yeah, that's what I made you for. Right. I made you to be blessings and caregivers and takers and, and, and whatever in the world. So um, the resurrection is, <laughs> it's such a weird thing. It's, it's a big deal. The <laughs> resurrection is a very big deal. It's the final deal. Yeah. It's, it's what it's all yeah. leading up to. Yeah. So um, if you guys have any questions, you can email joel at 514church.com or john at 514church.com. And this is just an extremely fun discussion and if you want to sit down and talk about it over coffee or you want john and i to talk about more things in a podcast with the resurrection then then we will and this this is going to come out uh two days before our good friday services yeah. so please come to 514 church this friday um evening there's two services and then we have three Easter Sunday services on Easter Sunday, 9, 11, and 1. And we would love to have you guys there to celebrate the truth of the resurrection. I think a, a couple, so maybe last podcast, the one that was released last week, yep. um, part two of our cross mm -hmm. discussion, we, we dove into the confrontation of Jesus, mm -hmm. the power of good yes. versus the power of evil. Power of evil which is kind of where you're going yeah, yep. with your Good Friday yep, message. Yep. That is that is one of the most exciting aspects of the cross. And it so is. if you're hearing this days before Good Friday, mm -hmm. you're wondering if you should come. You should come. You should come and hear that and celebrate mm -hmm. and celebrate that not just a transaction has taken place, but that the enslaving powers of darkness that act upon us in this world have been defeated. confronted and defeated by Jesus. Yeah. That's why we said, that's why it's called Good Friday. Yeah, that's right. It's Beautiful. exciting to, to, and if you experience it in your own life and you see it in the world around you, it's all the more life-giving, but it's what you want. And Jesus knows if he really is the creator of the cosmos, he knows exactly what you need and he knows exactly what you don't need. 
and he did everything he could to give you give you both and take away what you don't need. So uh, we can talk about the resurrection for a long time, and of course we will. But with that, uh, that is the rest, and we will catch up with you guys next time. Thanks so much. Bye.